This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Dr. Stock and Dr. Roll are going to not only try to educate you, but also entertain you, I hope. And they're going to be discussing the new kidney allocation system called CAS, which was introduced December 4 of last year. And they will be discussing both the intended consequences of this and some unintended consequences of this uh, new allocation system. Uh, it's one pie, so there may be people who win and people who may lose a tiny bit. And so they'll tell us the winners and the losers. Where is Gary? Yeah, it's right there. Oh, it's he's going to come up in, in just a second. So can we have the first slide? Thank, thank you, Flavio. So um, I, I heard... Uh, Sorry, thank you. I heard uh, Dr. Roberts claiming he was the second oldest person here, and it's really sad when we're all fighting to be who's the oldest person here, but I'm the third oldest person. Although I saw Tom Lanovich come back. Yay, yay, Steve, back, coming back. So now I'm the fourth oldest person here. Um, so what I'm, uh, I'm going to be very brief because we're way over time. And you heard me last last year talk about the new allocation system that, that, that was being worked on for dozens of years that finally went into effect. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what I'd like to do is very, very briefly review what the new system is, how it compared to the old system. I'm going to do that in five minutes. And then I'm going to introduce our new partner, Garrett Roll, um, who is going to tell, tell us what the impact of that system was. Now, as we're doing this, um, I, I, there are some, some of you in the audience, actually, uh, who have not been pleased about the outcomes in some of your recipients. Um, and <clears throat> your question, very appropriately, is how could you give my recipient this kidney that didn't work? And we're going to show you the constraints that we have so you understand exactly how this happens. And really, we want, we want to engage you to ask any questions you, you, you have, uh, because it's not, not that straightforward. So here um, is the, um, uh, <clears throat> the old system. Two types of donors, standard criteria donors, the bulk of the donors, and extended criteria donors. In the old system, we used to, they, basically, the kidneys were allocated by waiting time. And it wasn't based on when you started dialysis, it was based on when you were referred for transplant. You could be preemptively transplanted if, you, if your referring doctor uh, got you there um, when your GFR was less than 20, which is when we still can list you for transplant. PRA was a uh, percent reactive antibody. Um, if you had a PRA of greater than 80%, you got four points. Other than that, you really, four points, I think of a point as the equivalent of a year of waiting time. So if you had a high PRA, you got some benefit, but, but um, four, you got four years of waiting time. And then finally, you got a point for HLA matching, just the DR, which is still there. Uh, extended criteria donors were just uh, done by waiting time. So what was an extended criteria donor? It was, a, it was a totally binary system. Extended criteria donors were Simply, if the donor was over age 60, they were, they were an extended criteria donor. And now that <clears throat> I'm almost an extended criteria donor, I'm, I, I, think that's, I think my kidneys are OK. Um, now, the other, uh, if you were over 50 and had a creatinine greater than 1.5, hypertension or CVA uh, di died, the, died from a, uh, a, a CVA. Um, just two of those would make you an extended criteria donor. So that, that of course, ended up with a lot of good kidneys being considered ECDs uh, that weren't ECDs. 
Um, that doesn't exist anymore. So when your patients consent to getting an ECD kidney, they're getting an ECD kidney, and I'm going to show you how that is. So what, just to preview this, nationally, Garrett's going to talk about locally. The new system is predicted to add 8,000 additional life years. It improves access for, for the moderately and very highly sensitized candidates, and I'm going to show you how that happens. So keep in mind, if you have patients that are highly sensitized, they have a very high likelihood of getting a transplant now. So we have to get them ready for transplant. Um, it, it was hoped that we would improve um, access for ethnic minorities with rare HLA. And um, uh, we, the other thing they wanted to do was get comparable levels of kidney transplants at the regional and national levels. Uh, that's something that is, uh, has really not, there's still great geographic disparities. So um, here's the components. Um, the old binary system, standard criteria donor, extended criteria donor, um, has been placed, replaced with something called KDPI, Kidney Donor Profile Index. So instead of having uh, two categories, it's a continuum. I'll show you how that's, that's, um, that's done. We wanted to add a, a significant component of le longevity matching so that we weren't putting these kidneys from older donors into younger people who couldn't benefit from them. Uh, <clears throat> we wanted to increase the priority for the highly sensitized patients because they were just stagnating on our waiting lists. Uh, we wanted to shift the time of of, of the waiting time to the time you initiated dialysis. So that was a great deal, there was a great deal of controversy about that, but basically um, we wanted to protect those patients who didn't get access to transplant for any number of reasons until they had been on dialysis for two or three years. So now all waiting time is backdated to the time of the initiation of dialysis. Um, they, want, they incorporated uh, A2, and A to B kidneys uh, to go to B recipients, and that's really to, to correct for this very large disparity in um, Asians and African Americans not getting uh, who are who have a high rate of blood type B. So now we can use A two and A two B kidneys uh, into blood type B patients, um, and that has that has had an impact. Garrett will talk about that. Um, Pediatric, um, the, the pediatric system has only changed slightly. We wanted to get rid of all these payback, crazy payback systems. So if we got a kidney from New York, we'd have to pay back a kidney. That's gone. And we wanted to remove the variances. So now, uh, don't, don't look at the left side. Look at the right side. A kidney becomes available. It is now classified according to the KDPI, the Kidney Donor Profile Index, into four buckets. Um, if the KDPI is less than 20%, that's the best the best kidneys as predicted by longevity uh, when transplanted into an average donor. So, so that's category one. Category two is KDPI between 21 and 34. Category three is the bulk, sort of what we thought of as the standard criteria donors, KDPI between 35 and 85. And then finally, um, uh, the, what's the new ECD, which is KDPI greater than 85%. So, Kidney becomes available, it gets put in one of those buckets. How do we calculate the KDPI? Uh, without going into a lot of detail, everything on the left side of your screen is how we calculate a KDPI. So it, is there a hypertension in the donor, diabetes in the donor? Is there a high creatinine in the, in the donor? Are they small or do they have a large nephron mass? Um, is it a donation by cardiac death, a DCD donor or, or a brain dead donor? Um, and does the donor have HCV? So it's a pretty good predictor of um, how long uh, the, the, uh, the graphs are going to survive. So if you look at two year, let's just look at the red line, two year graph survival. Um, the best kidneys on the left side, KDPI between zero and 20%, you can see uh, the average graph survival um, is somewhere around 90% for those kidneys. And you go all the way down to a KDPI of, of um, 85, and 90, and 100%. You can see the slope really doesn't change dramatically until you get above 85. And that is how they came up with this new category of ECDs being KDPI greater than 85%. So don't want you to focus too much on that, but it tells you within each bucket 
how the allocation system happens. Largely driven by waiting time, but a huge significance now um, if you're a highly sensitized patient. I'll show you the points for that. So sequence A, the, the best kidneys now are going to get allocated to the recipients that have the best predicted survival time post-transplant. Um, and I'll show you how that's calculated. It's a little bit rough. But basically, it's called EPTA, Estimated Post-Transplant, EPTS, e Estimated Post-Transplant Survival Time. You know who those patients are. They're the young patients that have glomerulonephritis. Um, they fall into bucket A. Um, sequence B also um, goes to uh, good candidates, but because pediatric patients were getting shorted on the kidneys in the new allocation system, the sequence B also is between 20 and 35%, and those are really good kidneys. Those are going to go to, um, kids go right to the top in that sequence. Sequence C is the bulk of the kidneys. Um, but you can see it goes from a KDPI of 35 to 85. And when we get into this discussion now, when, when Garrett starts talking about um, some of the, 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 the uh, patients that we have, what do we do with that KDPI kidney that comes in at 70%? And we get our waiting list, and your patient's at the top of it. So they're getting the 70% KDPI, not the 35% KDPI. That's, we'll show you what happened. And, um, uh, and, and if you want to weigh into that discussion, please do. Now, now, how do we decide what the estimated post-transplant survival is? Um, it's the top 20% of candidates. It's really driven by age. Um, but it also relates to time on dialysis. The longer you are on dialysis, the less likely you're, you are to have a good outcome. Uh, if you've had a prior organ transplant, less likely to have a good outcome. And diabetes, that's a major driver as well. So the new allocation system was, was really designed to prevent this mismatch, although I don't want to be judgmental. Okay, <laughs> so. And what about workflow changes? So um, now you can imagine our, our world got blown up because now we can't predict who's at the top of the list. We're getting a good sense of it. But that leaves our coordinators with a list of 4,000 4, people. Who's going to draw the offer? And we've got to make sure they're ready so they can get that offer. We're going to be talking about that throughout this whole meeting. Uh, <clears throat> now, I told you that sensitized patients are going to have a big push. So here, here's how it goes. If you have a CPRA of 100%, and you now get national exposure. The whole country, you're on there, the national list. You, have, you get 212 points. And the reason that was done is if there is one kidney that comes up and, and you're compatible with it, you get that kidney. And it is absolutely amazing. We're, we're transplanting 100% PRAs now. 99%, they only get regional. They draw regional offers but they get somewhere around 100 points. So they're sitting at the top of the lists. So we got to get our highly sensitized patients greater than 98% uh, transplanted, but you can see anything over 90%, you're getting a lot of points. It's exponential, and it's done, it was, it was carefully done, and, and I've been impressed with how well the system has worked in terms of getting our, our sensitized uh, patients transplanted. Um, so we've got to get them ready for transplant. Um, we also have a whole cadre of patients now that have up to 10 points because they've been on, on dialysis for 10 years. The other thing that this does, by backdating time to the time of the initiation of dialysis, if we have a marginal candidate, we're going to be talking about BMI later on today, if we have somebody with a BMI of 50 and they come to us for transplant and we're like, gosh, what are the chances of this person making it to transplant? Um, we don't have to list them. They're not losing anything by us not listing us. Once they lose the weight necessary to move forward with the transplant, we can list them and they'll get all the years of waiting time. So um, it sort of has changed the way we think about it. We can talk about that. Um, so uh, the marginal candidates might not get listed until they're ready to get transplanted. Um, the other thing that I think you got to be prepared for is patients receiving the high KDPI kidneys those are high KDPI kidneys now. We still are getting lucky with some that, that, that aren't that bad, but some are, some are pretty, um, uh, pretty bad. Um, just to show you that outcome though, even the bad ones, take a look over there. Um, they're, they're about 15 or 
less graph survival than the best ones. So keep that in mind. And the other thing, please pay attention to the fact that between zero and 70%, there is not that huge of a difference. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop there. And I wanna introduce my new car, our new colleague, it's taken us 10 years to hire a new surgeon, so you know he's good. Um, I used to be as tall as Garrett when I started. I don't know if you remember that, um, but um, actually, I, he, he was, when he, when he was our fellow, I hated to operate with him because I always, well, he's really good, but I had to stand on like two, two things. Same with operating with John Roberts. And my fantasy was always that if, if I became the chief, which I haven't become, um, I would set up an operating room where I could push a button and instead of me having to stand on a platform, they would go down into the ground. <laughs> but anyway, Garrett. Thank you very much. Hopefully we don't invent that hole in the ground, but we may. So I'm gonna talk about the effects of the allocation system on our practice at UCSF, and I'm gonna talk about the use of donors with a high KDPI, and then we're gonna go through a couple cases. We've prepared four cases uh, to talk about the specific challenges that we face as transplant surgeons deciding who to put these kidneys in, but I'm not sure we're gonna have time for all four. We'll do our best. So we've talked about the size of our waiting list and the fact that we transplant about 2% of the kidney transplants that happen in this country, so any changes in allocation really are important for us. This is the makeup of our waiting list. You can see that we have a very large number of highly sensitized patients. So if you look at just the 99 to 100% sensitized patients, we have 300 patients in that category, or in those two categories. And if you look at patients who are sensitized greater than 85%, we have 600 patients waiting for transplant who have a CPRA between 85 and 100. So that's a very large number. This is a different way to look at our waiting list, and it's a little bit of a confusing slide, but this is basically all the patients on our waiting list who have more than seven points. So these people are approaching transplant. And sensitization is lowest on the left and gets higher on the right, and the, uh, the furthest on the right is 100% sensitized. The black is patients who have had a previous kidney transplant. So the patients who are not in black are divided between male and female, so blue and pink. And you can see that there are a large number of patients who have not had a previous kidney transplant that are very highly sensitized. And most of those patients are females. So I think the most powerful columns are the ones in the middle. These are 99% sensitized. So these people are, are getting regional offers but not national offers. And only 30% of these patients basically have had a previous kidney transplant. So that means a huge majority of the patients who are very highly sensitized are females that have uh, had multiple children or had uh, blood transfusions, probably from uh, probably multiple children is the etiology of this. But it just shows you that um, a huge majority of our patients who are highly sensitized are females, and they were previously disadvantaged in, under the old system. This is another way to look at basically the same data. It's again a moving sensitization is, is lowest on the right and 100% sensitized on the. I'm sorry, lowest on the left, 100% sensitized on the right. And you can see that there's a lot of females that are highly sensitized on our waiting list with a lot of points. So what I'm gonna talk about in terms of the impact um, on what has actually happened since the changes at UCSF, we're gonna talk about less predictable waiting time. We're gonna talk about changes in access to organ offers for different groups of patients. Talk about the influence of cross-matching strategy on our ability to transplant patients something that Dr. Tomlanovich started and, and has continued, and uh, talk about how we incorporate KDPI when we make a decision about how to, uh, if we should accept an organ offer and who we should accept it for. So talking about wait time predictability, this is the time from listing to the patient getting an organ offer. Before the changes, this was a relatively predictable period of time from listing to getting an offer. And during that time, we could list candidates who would have a reasonable chance of being transplantable in six to 10 years. They would have the time course of their waiting time to overcome any reversible contraindications to transplant. And we could see them again in clinic at a, uh, at a scheduled time, make sure that they had overcome those contraindications and get their cardiopulmonary testing done, get their antibody testing up to date, and make sure that they were ready to receive an offer when they would get one. 
And at that time, we were keeping about 300 patients ready for a transplant at any given time. After the changes, we've had a much more difficult time um, trying to figure out who is going to get an offer and when. We are definitely learning and we're uh, getting much better, but initially we had a difficult time predicting who was going to get an offer and when. So we had to restructure the timing of our pre-transplant testing to make sure that people were getting tested before they would get organ offers, because the last thing you want is to call in a patient for transplant, bring them into the hospital and have to get a cardiac calf, an echo, a chest CT to work up a lung nodule, because at 2 a.m. those tests are difficult to get and they often are not the best. And sometimes the evening radiologist will read a scan one way, you do the transplant, the scan gets read another way. It's really not the best way to work up a patient. So we really do our best to get the workup done before they start getting organ offers. We think that's very important. We're having to apply a bit more scrutiny to patients at the time of listing because, as Dr. Stock pointed out, it's a little bit uh, difficult to predict when they're going to get organ offers. So uh, people with reversible contraindications to transplant, um, we have to apply a little bit more scrutiny to those patients before they get an organ offer. So in this era, we're having to keep 900 patients ready for a transplant at any given time, compared to 300 prior to the changes. So that's a significant workload that I know some of the people over on this side of the room are dealing with on a daily basis, and they're doing a great job. And we've had to add some coordinators to do that, because it's, uh, it's been a lot of work. So who are these 900 patients that we're keeping ready for a transplant at any time? Any patient with more than six points or any, basically any blood group AB patient and any patient who accepts a donor from a high, a kidney from a high KDPI donor because this group of patients can get an offer almost at any time. And these offers in the highly sensitized patients come from all over the country. Often the, the kidneys have, uh, have traveled a long distance to get to UCSF. So it makes our cross-matching strategy very important and as I said, we started to shift our cross-matching strategy a few years ago under Dr. Tomlanovich, and this, the KAS changes have really amplified the importance of that. So as you probably know, there's two types of cross-matching. There's physical cross-match, which is the physical mixing of cells from the donor and serum from the recipient. So cells are shipped from the donor to our ITL lab and mixed with the serum from the recipient to look for reactivity. And there is a risk of a false positive with this test. There's probably a 10, maybe 15% risk of a false positive. And then there's virtual cross-match, which is a little bit of a misnomer. But basically, a virtual cross-match cross is just the comparison of all the, don all the recipient's antibodies, both current and historical, against um, the particular donor in question. And uh, it's really not a cross-match per se, it's an estimation or it's a quantification of donor-specific antibodies. So it, it's really, it should be called a, a donor-specific antibody um, quantification, but it, it's not really a cross-match. It's just something that takes uh, on the order of a few minutes and, uh, and can be done relatively easy compared to a physical cross-match, which takes hours of transportation of cells and a four to six hour test done in the ITL lab. So there are a lot of advantages to a virtual cross-match. It adds precision because there's no false positive results as you have with a physical cross-match. It definitely reduces workload because there's no sample shipment required, reduces laboratory testing. The four to five hour cross-match test doesn't have to be done in the middle of the night. Uh, it definitely improves our allocation efficiency because when you do a physical cross-match, often the physical cross-match is cooking as the kidney is being transported across the country. So if that kidney lands in San Francisco and then the cross match is positive, that kidney has to be reallocated and then shipped to another location. And that adds a lot of cold time for kidneys. So even, especially for um, older kidneys from older donors, those can be very traumatic events for a kidney if it has to be reallocated late in the process. So we really try to avoid that as much as possible. And our virtual cross match helps us do that. I'll show you that in the next slide. And it's really increased our ability to get highly sensitized patients transplanted under the new kidney allocation system. And any efficiency we can add is critical with such a large waiting list because inefficiencies are definitely magnified. So in the first eight months after the kidney allocation system changes, we were able to virtual cross-match about 86% of our donor-recipient pairs, and we only had to do a physical cross-match less than 15% of the time. 
which is pretty great considering that we're transplanting so many highly sensitized patients. So it's transplanting a lot of patients who have a CPRA over 85%, but we're able to do this with the virtual cross match and not have to ship cells across the country. And this is really important because if you look at the number of kidneys imported uh, over the last four years, the three years leading up to the KAS changes we imported, about 80 or 90 kidneys per year. But after, in the, the last year, we've imported 141 kidneys. Um, these are coming from all over the place and often you know, have long cold times. So if we reallocate kidneys after they arrive, that's really not good for our recipients or for the region. And of these 141 kidneys that we brought in in 2015, with our virtual cross-matching strategy, we only had to reallocate two kidneys of those 141, which is pretty good. So we've talked a little bit about the wait list and allocation and cross-matching challenges. So who's actually getting transplanted after the changes at UCSF? Well, here's some of the data. I think Dr. Roberts showed a, a similar slide in the beginning. This is data from one year before the changes in blue and then seven or eight months of data after the changes in red. And you can see that the unsensitized patients or the not as sensitized patients have a little bit less access to transplant or are getting transplanted at, at, a, at a little bit of a lower rate. And the highly sensitized patients, as you move to the right, are getting transplanted uh, more frequently. And we reran this data just a few weeks ago, and it's even more pronounced. So uh, about 5% of our recipients have a CPRA of 99%, and 22% of our recipients in the last year have a CPRA of 100%. So um, there's definitely a bolus effect going on, but it doesn't, uh, you know, Dr. Roberts described, but it's definitely continuing. So if you look at who's actually being transplanted, these, uh, these are the ones where there was a, a dramatic change before and after the KES, so these are the ones I'm going to highlight. If you look at the three years before compared to the one year after the changes, females definitely have much more access to transplant, which is wonderful. We went from transplanting 38% females to 52%, which is great. You can see that our highly sensitized patients also have much more access to transplant. So I chose greater than 85% CPRA as highly sensitized. So if you look at the three years before the changes, we were transplanting about 8% of people who had a, a CPRA over 85%. Currently, we're, training, we're transplanting 43% of our patients have a CPRA over 85%. Uh, blood group A, B patients seem to have a little bit better access to organs, and unfortunately, type 2 diabetics seem to have a little bit less access to organs. We're going from 28% of our transplants in type 2 diabetics down to 20% after the changes. We've seen our waiting times decrease by about a year, although there are some highly sensitized patients who had been transplanted after waiting for 10 years, so that data is a little bit difficult to interpret, but um, we're definitely transplanting some patients that have been on the list for a long, long time. But overall, our waiting time has decreased. Our age at transplant, again, probably for the same reason, is a little bit lower. And we're transplanting many, many more patients who have had a previous kidney transplant. So previously, about 12% of our patients had a kidney transplant in the past. And now, basically, a quarter of our patients have had a previous kidney transplant. So in summary, after the changes, it's been uh, much less predictable in terms of the timing from listing to getting a first organ offer. So it's reduced our freedom a little bit to liberally list all candidates. Uh, it's changed our workflow uh, for the pre-transplant testing and how we've had to ensure that the pre-transplant testing gets done before patients get organ offers. And that's been a huge amount of work. Uh, so we've added coordinators. We're doing, we're continuing to do more virtual rather than physical cross-matching for many reasons, but um, uh, the importance of the, the virtual cross-match is highlighted by the stresses of the KAS system. And we've definitely seen an alteration in our recipient pool. There's definitely more highly sensitized recipients. Females have more access to transplant, and type 2 diabetics have a little bit less access to transplant under the new system. So let's switch gears and talk about high KDPI kidneys and some of the challenges that we face. So high KDPI offers make up over 31% of the offers that we get. So when we get phone calls, uh, uh, 
about a third of them are for these kidneys that have a KDPI over 85%, so basically extended criteria donors. And I can tell you as surgeons, we feel like these kidneys are definitely, there are diamonds in the rough or there are needles in the haystack, but the haystack is, is not pretty, but there are good kidneys in that haystack. And it's really our job to figure out of those large number of calls that we get about these kidneys, which ones are good and which ones are not. So how many do we actually accept? Well, in 2015, we accepted eight, which is about three or four percent of our transplants. Uh, and in 2016, so far, we've accepted six, which is about three and a half percent of our transplants. So you can see that we're really, we're really looking closely at these kidneys, and we are suspect of a huge number of these kidneys. But we do find diamonds in the rough, and uh, that's what we continue to try to do. Uh, I'll rush through some of this data a little bit. It's in your packet. This is probably data that you've seen before, but it's the rationale for the use of extended criteria donors, which are now high KDPI donors. You can see that the relative risk of mortality goes uh, below one if you get transplanted with an extended criteria donor, um, and that survival benefit lasts past four years. This is uh, compared to waiting on the waiting list for a standard criteria donor. This is basically the same type of data analysis about 10 years later, now not talking about extended criteria donors, but using the high KDPI terminology. So again, these authors have shown there's a benefit to using high KDPI donors from high, uh, kidneys from donors with a high KDPI. And they broke those high KDPI kidneys up into three groups. And you can see even, uh, it's probably a little bit small to see, but even the donors who had a KDPI of 91 to 100 percent, so the worst category of donors, uh, did generate a survival benefit compared to waiting on the waiting list for a lower KDPI donor. And that survival benefit lasted out past five years. And this group of authors uh, came to the conclusion that even for the highest KDPI donors, the 91 to 100 percenters, those donors should be used if a recipient is over 50 years old and is uh, at a center with a waiting time that's longer than 33 months. Those recipients uh, derive benefit even from the highest KDPI donors. This, of course, is only donors that are selected for transplant by a transplant surgeon, so this doesn't take into account all of the offers that we get, but this takes into account the offers that are accepted, so the small percentage of offers that are actually accepted. This is an interesting slide in this, um, in this article that I thought highlighted nicely that, you, you know, if you look at 100,000 kidney transplants and um, what age the recipients are compared to the donors, there's a lot of disparity. And if you just look at the very low quality donors, so these would be the highest KDPI donors, these donors, if you look throughout the country, are being used in some some people would say younger recipients, so um, there's a surprising number of, of these donors that go into uh, recipients under 50 years of age. We tend to use these high KDPI donors in patients who are 50 sometimes, but usually more in the 60s and sometimes up into the 70s. So we tend to use them in this range much more than in the younger recipients. I would say we're maybe a little bit more conservative than the rest of the country in this respect. So we're getting about 30% of our offers from high KDPI donors. We're using maybe a tenth or so of those offers. Uh, so we're very highly selecting these kidneys, but we're also highly selecting our recipients for these kidneys. We do our best to make sure that we're using these kidneys in the right recipients. Sometimes we don't always make the perfect decision, but this is the thought process that we're going through. So we try to use these kidneys in older recipients and in smaller recipients and in recipients who have a special need for dialysis so they can derive the benefit. I mean, a special uh, need for transplant so that they can derive the benefit. So we have a few cases um, to highlight the difficulties with high KDPI donors. I think I'll probably go on to, to the third case, just in the interest of time here. And of course, I'm probably going to ask for Dr. Stock's input, but if anybody has any questions or any comments during the cases, please feel free to speak up. Um, these are actual uh, donors with their actual match run and, and um, their recipients and their outcomes with all of the identifying information removed.
So this is a 50-year-old donor that we get a call about. Uh, the donor is a little bit on the smaller side, five foot four, but a little bit obese. It's a blood group AB donor. There are some vague symptoms, and um, this is what you get when you get an organ offer. You, you, you hear some vague description that uh, the patient had some symptoms of CHF over the last month, but no one really knows what that was about. History, a short history of high blood pressure. There's some nondescript methamphetamine use, but it's not really quantified. And the patient has a short smoking history of five years, although, I mean, I don't really know too many people who start smoking at age 45, but this is the kind of information that we get. So you have to, you know, take it all with a grain of salt and trust what you trust and use, you know, use your best judgment. This patient died of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. They had an admission creatinine of 0.7, and as commonly happens with brain death, the terminal creatinine was, was on the way up. Uh, it was 1.48 at the time of um, organ donation. So the terminal KDPI is therefore 78. So this donor has a KDPI of 78, falls in sequence C, not even in the highest um, sequence, not even in the, the worst category over there in sequence D, which is KDPI of 85%. We have a KDPI in the 70s, so we're in sequence C. This is being allocated to basically most of our recipients. So here's um, the first recipient that it's allocated to. It's a 59-year-old female with hypertension. It's been on dialysis for, for about three years. Remember, this is an AB kidney, so a little bit shorter waiting time. It's a smallish recipient, 5'3", uh, a little bit overweight, um, and the CPRA was 11%. So maybe, Dr. Stock, what do you think about this donor and recipient pair? So I look at that donor, and you know, the, the KDPI of 78%, it's, um, I think that's probably a pretty good, re a realistic picture of that kidney. It's a, it's a blood growth of a young 50 year old donor, he's 10 years younger than me, and um, he's, he's small, okay? So he's small. And um, I would want to put that kidney into a small person. Um, so I think uh, the 59-year-old woman who has end-stage failure from hypertension uh, is petite. Um, I, I think this is an okay kidney for her, but there, there are some things that I worry about. Um, the hypertension for three years, I, I, I probably don't buy that. Methamphetamine use, that's probably why he, uh, why, why he had the subarachnoid bleed. He probably had a big spike. I'd, I'd want to know if there was any LVH in the donor. Um, but those are all things that aren't accounted for in the KDPI. There's nothing about methamphetamine use in the KDPI. There's nothing about CHF in the KDPI. So, um, I mean, I think if, you, if, we, if we say no to this patient, who are we going to say yes to? And this is what our kidneys are like. So I, um, I'm in favor of transplanting this patient, but uh, I, I believe, and Garrett, you have to help me out here, and this isn't being set up. This might be the patient that was problematic. Is this the patient who had the problems? Yeah, so. The <laughs> so tell us what happened. So we go ahead, and the transplant surgeon on call that day agrees with you know, our assessment that this is probably a reasonable kidney to use in a small recipient who is not young. Um, unfortunately, we transplant this kidney, and you, can, you can't see the numbers, but clearly the creatinine um, does not drop, and we don't have initial graft function, so we have delayed graft function. Um, we go on to get a biopsy after transplant. It shows some donor-derived arterial sclerosis, which I'm sure you can't read here, and also suggests uh, antibody-mediated rejection, so we treat that with steroids. The recipient goes on to get CMV viremia, and uh, immunosuppression is reduced. We get another biopsy because the kidney is still not chugging, not, not working well, and it shows significant donor-derived arterial disease. And unfortunately, the, the patient did end up going back on dialysis and did not have uh, the outcome that we had hoped um, by transplanting this kidney. So I don't know if you have any, any well, comments. Can, that can you, what, what, what happened with the mate kidney? So the mate kidney uh, actually did reasonably well. I think the creatinine is um, about 1.3 or 1.4. That kidney had immediate function. Um, it had a little bit of a shorter cold ischemia time, but 
is, is working well, that, that patient has not uh, had difficulty. I, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I, I think maybe, I mean, if I wanted to be judgmental and looking at the retrospectoscope, I would say we should have biopsied that kidney. And, um, and, then, and then what do we do if we find out that it has um, um, arterial disease, which it obviously does. So I, I think then I would shift the list and I would tell Maria, who I see sitting over there, Maria, please look at the list and tell me who's the first ECD on the list who will accept the kidney. I can guarantee you the kidney will leave our center then. It'll be shipped down to Southern California and centers there will, will happily take this kidney and put it into uh, a candidate who's going to be ahead of our first ECD kidney. But uh, let, me, let me ask Dr. Fries, who is uh, probably more aggressive than I am. What, what do you think? Um, I, I would have used the kidney uh, in this particular patient for the reasons you stated. I mean, the biopsy issue is problematic, of course, because if we start lowering our threshold for biopsies, we're going to be turning down a lot more kidneys. That's been demonstrated over and over. And I think, you know, in the transplant community, we just have to accept the fact that not every kidney is going to be a 20-year-old perfect donor. There's going to be a spectrum. And, you know, we're battling the problem with weightless mortality. And so, you know, if, if I was faced with this uh, kidney uh, offer, I would have done exactly what was done here. I think by virtue of the fact that the May kidney actually has pretty reasonable creatinine, I think this outcome couldn't be totally attributed to the quality of the kidney, but also the fact that there was some early rejection. So you know, there's other things that play into outcome rather than just the quality of the kidney. So Chris, if you were, if you were, um, uh, if you had the biopsy, if you had a pre-transplant biopsy result and you, and you got that there was arterial thickening and evidence of hypertension, um, how are you going to, what are you going to do with the list? What are you going to tell Maria? I, I probably would have um, done what you suggested is go to the more desperate patient group, which are the patients who have pre-consented for a high KDPI kidney. But, then, no but we'd, yeah, we'd lose the kidney. But, you know, that's, that's the way life works uh, when you're trying to place these kidneys. But, uh, <clears throat> Peter, the fact that the contralateral kidney functions so well. Exactly. Well, it was put in a smaller recipient. Yeah, but, but still, I mean. How small can you get? They, yeah, no. Uh, you know. I, you wonder whether there were some recipient um, conditions that that deteriorated the uh, the histology. In other words, you find uh, atherosclerosis, but maybe that was not the cause of why the kidney never functioned. In other words, you can't look at histology. Uh, uh, kidneys are actually typically, uh, those of us who've dealt with glomerulonephritis and so on, we know that you biopsy a patient with lupus, you see horrible glomeruli and the creatinine is one too. So there is always a disconnect between histology and function. And so jumping to the conclusion that that kidney got lost because of the vascular changes, maybe, you know, not totally. Uh, but I, I, I do want, you know, the, I, I, I hope the referring doctor who's in the, I, I think is maybe here today and that's why we put it up here because you know, they're, they're sitting out there going, what kind of crazy people are there at UCSF that are going to put a kidney like this in? And, and it's not, you know, it, it's a bit of a problem. And we just want you to be aware that we're not being willy-nilly about this. Um, but it is, it, it, <laughs> there's a fine balance. Saying, did you have a comment? You know, I, th I think ECD kidneys or ECD-like kidneys going into patients with low to, you know, normal or even hypotensive, those are the patients that we cannot be putting these kind of transplants into. I think that's something that we're realizing. I don't know if that had anything to do with this case, whether the pressures were different, but that's just another thing to, to think about. Right. I think that's a good point. Dr. Fang. finding as we transplant kidneys is that the KDPI actually looks way better than the kidney because the population that is dying and contributing kidneys is 10 years sicker than 10 years ago. 
And young people have horrific looking kidneys, young people in their 40s and 50s. And so I think this is you know, something that we are all grappling with is frankly is the overall deteriorating quality of the donor pool. And that applies to living donors, it applies to deceased donors because it's the deteriorating health of the American population based on obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and the metabolic syndrome. So this may be why our outcomes are not what any of us would like. It's because the pool of donors is not the way we, it used to be and will probably never be that way again. So in the interest of time, I think we'll do one more case, but we'll do it relatively quickly. I think um, this is a case where the donor had a moderately high KDPI, but again, was still in the, what you would call the standard criteria or in sequence C, not into sequence D. It's a 56-year-old it's a Chinese female who's short, um, BMI of 19, so a smaller donor. Um, not too much past medical history, borderline hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and some AFib. Died of an intracerebral hemorrhage in the terminal creatinine. Uh, the admission creatinine was 0.6, the terminal creatinine was 0.7, but the peak was 0.9. So our terminal KDPI was 74%. So again, in the middle range, uh, towards the upper end of the middle, but not into the uh, high KDPI range. So for, we got a, a biopsy for this kidney, and it, it looked fine, didn't show any uh, chronic changes. This kidney was put on the machine, on the, on the pump, and had good flow uh, and low resistance. So this kidney looked good uh, based on the numbers, based on the biopsy, based on the data that we had, but it was still a relatively high KDPI kidney. I mean, this is a 74. So. Uh, the important thing is which recipient you choose this kidney, you choose to put this kidney in. And due to the size of the donor, again, she was 5'5 five five and a BMI of 19, and the KDPI of 74, we actually used our extended criteria list to find a recipient for this donor. So uh, this is a 62-year-old female who's uh, blood group A, 5'6, a little bit overweight, and has a CPRA of 27. Uh, she was, we had to drop down to number 24 on the match run to get to this recipient who had accepted an extended criteria donor, even though this donor didn't fall into the extended criteria category. That was the decision the transplant surgeon made on that night. And here's, our recipient had good initial functions on steroid withdrawal, maintenance immunosuppression, creatinine um, is 1.4. We're a few months out from transplant, still awaiting our six-month protocol biopsy. But this is a case where the kidney was not really classified as high KDPI, but we chose a recipient who had accepted a high KDPI kidney because of the size of the donor and our kind of assessment of the kidney as being more high KDPI than the number actually represented. So I think that kind of highlights some of the difficulties we face with these offers and the things that we struggle with with uh, your patients. And I hope that has been a little bit enlightening. And we'll move on to Dr. Fang.